Good evening, church. It's good to be with you this, uh, it's actually Tuesday afternoon, about 2.30 in the afternoon, but I'm recording for our Wednesday night class on April uh, the 14th, and so it's, it's, it's fun. It's good being with you, and it's uh, been interesting in covering this topic. And so uh, <clears throat> we'll be in the Greco-Roman, or Greco, excuse me, Greco-Roman world again, and, and this week, we're going to discuss a little bit about, or show, uh, or make reference to a few scriptures and how they were shining a positive view on daughters and women of the first century, which I have uh, covered over the last several weeks and how the uh, Greco-Roman world uh, looked, uh, whether you want to call it down on or negatively, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the view that it had of uh, the uh, uh, daughters and women uh, was totally different than what it is here today. And so that's what we've been covering part of that, how households lived, how fathers oversaw families, so on and so forth. And so today, what I, I started last week with a few scriptures, I want to start transitioning into how scripture looked at this world or was pushing back on and was progressing on uh, progressing beyond what that world knew and understood and so I'll, I'll just share a few verses with you uh, and, and, and so we'll go from there. I, I should be with you for about 15 minutes and then um, we'll, <clears throat> we'll continue uh, probably through the end of the month uh, and so uh, next week I may do uh, religion and how religion was looked at during the Greco-Roman world. Alright, so um, let's get started. So uh, over the last, uh, uh, if you've done any studying of scripture, uh, you've probably have, this, you probably have discovered along with me that the Gospels revealed a variety, I guess if you want to call them social classes, uh, but revealed uh, a variety of social classes and, and almost a, uh, a positive, or actually a positive view of, the, of daughters and women in the first century. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, for instance, the Canaanite woman. The Canaanite woman begs Jesus that, she, uh, that he might heal her daughter in Matthew 15, verse 21 uh, through 28. And so, why is that uh, interesting? Because, as we mentioned in the past, uh, women did not approach uh, men who were not their husbands and weren't supposed to. Uh, approach men that were not their husbands. And so this is a very interesting uh, scripture from that perspective in that this woman goes beyond the norm to reach out to Jesus. So uh, another scripture um, in the book of Acts, uh, there's a brief note about Philip and his four daughters who were, according to scripture, who were prophets in Acts chapter 21 and verse 9. So it's another, again, interesting scripture of how women are looked at in Paul's writings versus how the world at the time, at the time looked at them. Um, how about Paul's uh, co-worker in Timothy, who was brought up by his Jewish mother, Eunice and his grandmother Lois in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, again, it's mentioned, women are mentioned in a positive light. Um, what a, uh, contrary to custom, <clears throat> right? So here's one for contrary to the first century custom. Jesus spoke freely to women in public. You'll see it in 1 John chapter 8, verse 10 through 11. And not only did, did Jesus speak to women freely in public, again, men didn't take time out to teach women, especially if they weren't married to them. And women didn't approach men that were not their husbands. But there's also another instance. So we look at another instance in... Um, and Luke chapter 10 verse 39, Mary and Martha see, um, you see Jesus teaching, quote, uh, theology uh, to a woman. Again, that's contrary to custom, the customs of the first century. And so when you look at the, those two instances in John and Luke, uh, we look at them and we sort of don't think nothing of it. We just read them uh, because they're in the scriptures. And, and it's okay to read them because they're in the scriptures, but uh, we typically don't think nothing of it as we skim through and read through it rather quickly. But in the first century, 
those two events went against the social norms. That's my only point, that those two instances in Scripture show the gospel or the message or Scripture going against what was normal in that day and time. All right? So um, how about the Bible specifically describing uh, Phoebe? That's another, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't, I use the word progressive, but that's another forward thinking, another uh, a deviation from the norm and the customs of the first century. But um, the Bible describes Phoebe, and, and I quote the Bible for you, okay? I, 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 I'm not letting living, I'm quoting the scripture for you, but it says, Our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in uh, Centuria, San, it depends on how you, some people pronounce it, Centuria, Centuria, uh, but nevertheless, he mentions a sister in Christ who was a deacon of the church in that city in Romans chapter 16, verse 1 through 2. Now, he doesn't just limit it to mentioning uh, 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 Phoebe as a deacon in, in the church, but he also mentions women who pray and women who prophesy, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. Now, I'm not trying to get into all the different arguments about what those verses mean. My only point is that Scripture is going against the norm of the, 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 the norms of that society, the norms of the first century, the norms of the Greco-Roman world. That is my only argument. I'm not trying to make a different argument here uh, at all. So don't do not read into um, <coughs> any of <laughs> any of that. I'm just simply trying to illustrate to you how Scripture looked favorably on women where the Greco-Roman world did not. All right. So let's go on. So um, yeah. So not only uh, what did Paul mention them in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse five as women who prayed and prophesied, but also that uh, women were among the prophets. In the, I don't know if you know, if you remember this or even realize this, but that women were among the prophets at the day of Pentecost, when Peter observed the Holy Spirit falling on men, and Acts is very specific on men and women. Then he goes and he says, according to the prophet Joel, who Peter quoted when he says, your, when he says, um, <laughs> I was at a, um, having a uh, brain moment. Uh, your, if he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy even on my servants, men and women, Acts chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 12 or 14, somewhere around there. So uh, pr another instance of how scripture looked at uh, women uh, differently than the world. How about Priscilla and Aquila? Uh, one of our, one probably of our favorite verses in Scripture. Uh, they clarified the gospel to a man named, Ap named Apollos in Acts chapter 18, verse 26. And Priscilla, uh, the wife, was the first mentioned in that Scripture. Paul also referred to Priscilla, Uidia, and Syntyche. Why couldn't they have easy names? <laughs> anyway, he mentioned them as followers, uh, fellow servants. Uh, over in Romans chapter 16 and also in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we just finished with mixed lesson this past Sunday and it was uh, Easter where the world recognized the, resur the resurrected Lord and so during that scene women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. They were mentioned in scripture. They were told by the angel at the tomb to go and tell uh, Jesus' disciples Go tell the disciples of Jesus that he has risen, Mark 16, verse 7. So when you look at the New Testament, uh, you could say the New Testament introduced and ushered in uh, opportunities for women that were not possible before then unless they were upper class wealthy women. And usually, what made them upper class wealthy woman or women was the status of their husband. Not always, but a majority of, of the time. And so it's interesting, interesting to note 
that scripture walks outside of the upper class wealthy women that were all, all that were sometimes considered um, uh, uh, or looked upon favorably. It's interesting that scripture looks at not not the upper class wealthy women, but women that were not of that nature, and still looks at them uh, on a, in a positive light, which is different than what again, as I mentioned a second ago, which is different than what uh, uh, the Greco. Roman world looked at it. Interesting how scripture paints a different light. And so uh, I, I love the way uh, scripture pushed against the norms. So what about um, women's education during antiquities or during the Greco-Roman world? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, most men, men, excuse me, men, most men consider intellectual activity predominantly a male practice. We went back and mentioned that in, in a couple of the other uh, sessions that we had, that men often considered, uh, men often considered intellectual activity, smart, brain, thinking people, predominantly as, as a male practice and not uh, the female persuasion. So this was, this was true even though, again, I go back to what I said a second ago, there were exceptions that were made for elite women, and some intellectuals praised the ability of women to learn, but that was like a small, small, small percentage of women. See, Greek men often married women over, I mentioned earlier or in an earlier lesson, Greek men often married women that were over a decade younger than they were. So it isn't surprising when a lot of their philosophers and historians like Plutarch observed that most husbands doubted that their wives could even learn. That's a sad reality of the times. We wouldn't think of that nowadays, but in their time, in their, their historians and their philosophers would often observe that and would often doubt uh, I doubt that women even had the ability to, to learn in that century, in that era. By contrast, uh, the same philosopher and, and uh, historian Plutarch advised a new groom to take, and you'll, you'll, you'll see all of this in my uh, reference uh, in the comment section, uh, but anyway, if I go back to Plutarch, advised a new groom, uh, he had just been married, he advised this new groom to take an interest in his wife's learning, all right? Although he warned him that if left to themselves, women, women are led astray by passions and also foolishness. And then women were also less likely to be literate than men. It's sometimes, um, well, it is, it is uh, history says that women were illiterate uh, at a rate of about 10% compared to men. So only about 10% of the women compared to men were literate, were having had the ability uh, to read. During that time, during the Greco or the first century, at least that we're talking about the Christian era, the two main or advanced disciplines of study that existed during that time uh, was um, philosophy and also uh, uh, rhetoric, all right? Philosophy and rhetoric. Some philosophers allowed women to be disciples, all right? But throughout the Greco and Roman world or antiquities, barely any of them were ever trained in rhetoric, which is public speaking. So while some philosophers allowed women to be disciples, barely any of them were ever trained to be uh, in rhetoric or again, um, public speaking, all right? So more relevant for the New Testament was uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish education in scripture. And the Jewish culture, uh, um, the Jewish culture reared and raised boys, but not normally girls to recite the Torah, which is the law. So in the Jewish culture, they taught and they reared boys to learn and to recite the Torah and the law, but that was not norm normally the case for girls. Now, granted, um, some women listened and learned in the synagogues. You couldn't help it. You're sitting there listening in the synagogues. 
and a few of them even attended rabbi, rabbi uh, lectures, yet they, me and women, were not taught to recite Torah, and rabbis did not train them as disciples. So it makes sense then when Paul says to, in 1 Corinthians, tells a, a, a wife, a woman, to go ask their husbands if they want to learn or if they want to know something. Because in the Greco-Roman world, women were not allowed to interrupt, were not allowed to challenge, were not allowed to speak publicly, uh, and, and again, especially challenge a rabbi or, some, or a rabbi given a lecture. And so instead of uh, interrupting a rabbi in giving a lecture or a teacher giving a lecture you know, or teaching law or teaching scripture, they were, they were then encouraged to go ask their husbands when they arrived at home. That's the context in which it is written in, all right? All right, I, I appreciate you being with me this, uh, this evening. And I hope that uh, uh, what I mentioned to you today is, is uh, uh, interesting and, and hopefully makes sense in, as you study scripture and hopefully challenges you more than anything else because all I'm giving you are tidbits, are, are morsels of history. And so hopefully it, it encourages you, it inspires you to learn more. And, and, and because I think what happens is as we learn uh, 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 history and as we learn culture, uh, first century culture, scripture becomes more vibrant, becomes more alive. It makes more sense uh, when you see those things and, and, and read those things. And so I hope that inspires you to at least start take up a book or two and start doing a little bit more reading. And I really believe that it will enhance uh, your scripture reading and will allow you to even uh, up your, I mean, really uh, help you in your study of the word. Anyway, good to be with you, and I look forward to being with you next, uh, next Wednesday. God bless, and I hope you have a good night.